Ian, nice to see you again. Uh, this is, uh, for those who haven't um, come across Ian before, Ian McGilchrist is the author of The Master and His Emissary, an extraordinary magisterial book released um, a few years ago now. Um, you're known mostly for that book, but I know that's not the beginning or end of your, your life or your interests. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happened since the book and, and what that's, how that's changed your interests and evolved your interests and what you're working on at the moment? Yes, well, I suppose the first thing that uh, I should say is I've been astonished by the response to it. I, I genuinely didn't anticipate it. So that has meant various things. I've given up um, my clinical practice to lecture and write. Um, and I'm in the middle of writing another, I'm afraid, damn thick square book. Um, because I, di I didn't intend to do this, but it, it's um, evolved from it when conversations with people. It's quite clear, of course, that if there are differences in the two worlds that we experience um, based on the two phenomenological experiences that are two hemispheres give us, this should apply to everything. Mm -hmm. And so people from every single walk of life have written to me saying this is extraordinary opposite to what's going on in my world, which might be, um, to my amazement, the world of finance or, or, or the legal world just as much as uh, the world of philosophy, psychology and psychiatry. So that's been very interesting. And I'm writing a book really uh, asking some rather basic questions, and of course there are no final answers to these questions, but we have to keep chipping away at them. And one is, um, how is it that we arrive at what we call truth? Uh, what do we use to, to help explore the world and find what we're going to call truth? Uh, and I, I, of course, accept that truth is a complicated uh, um, issue, what it is, and that's something I explore. But I'm looking at the main sort of powers that people would probably put forward. I mean, one is science, obviously. Uh, probably the first one that most people would put forward. Um, another is reason, another is intuition, and another is imagination. And I'm really looking at all of those. Um, my conclusion is that they're all valuable, um, but none of them is sufficient on its own. And then I'm looking at how uh, the two hemispheres shape um, the foundations of our world. In the Master's Hemisphere, I was looking at cultural history, but I'm now looking at the big issues of things like time, space, um, movement, personhood, right. beauty. So huge philosophical like the questions. Huge questions. From the perspective of your previous work. From the perspective, it's an extension right. of the previous work. So, but so it should be a, a book that can be read on its own. Okay, I understand. So for those who are not familiar with The Master and His Emissary, mm. can you, you probably practiced this a thousand times, but what is your sort of pressy of the, the fundamental idea that underlies that, that book and therefore also your next book? It's, it's built on some fairly simple bases. Um, it's not controversial that each hemisphere attends differently to the world. Uh, putting it simply, the left hemisphere uh, pays narrowly focused, um, uh, sharp uh, attention to details that are considered already uh, uh, of interest. Whereas the right hemisphere uh, does the rest, basically. It keeps a broad, sustained, vigilant attention open to the world without any commitment as to what it's going to find. And so that is uh, fairly well established. I don't think you'll find anyone who would uh, counter that. Um, and as philosophers and psychologists are familiar with this idea, um, the different attention you pay to the world changes what it is that you find there. Right. So what you find in the world very much depends on the nature and extent and kind of attention. And so the two hemispheres are likely to um, give us two experiential worlds. We're not aware of this because at a level below consciousness they're being alternated and fused, so we're not aware of that. But what this means is that when we come to talk about the world and, and um, express a, a position on it, we're going to want to adopt one or the other because we live in a culture where um, being um, not consistent is considered a sign that you're not thinking straight. Whereas, indeed, um, most of reality has paradoxical qualities if you begin to look at it carefully. And that's because the left hemisphere is seeing an aspect of the world and the right hemisphere is seeing another. Uh, but they're not strictly compatible. Yeah. 
And so uh, what I do in the Masterfulness Emissary is say, so we need to balance these. Are we in fact balancing them now in our culture? And I, after going explaining what the differences are, which affect every aspect of how we understand the world, I then look at the history of Western Europe, looking at times when it seems to me they've been well in balance, and my conclusion is that at the moment they're not, that the left hemisphere way is the only one we respect, and that the version of the world which is richer and more complex that the right hemisphere offers is harder to articulate and therefore doesn't get expressed, and is probably not coherent with the left hemisphere's version which seems so simple and logical. Yes, okay, I understand. And um, as you know, we've spoken about this before at length, and we produced a document for the RSA called Divided Brain, Divided World, mm. which is available online, and that was an attempt to really drill down into the theory and what it might mean. Things have moved along since then in many ways, in particular your own thinking uh, about how this applies to, for example, you, you know, finance or economics, mm. uh, and the, some of the political debates in the world. Now, mm. while you may not have a sort of if, if this, then that kind of mentality to it. Nonetheless, there's a relationship there that needs to be understood better. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that vis-a-vis -vis modern understandings of the economy, perhaps, or anything else you choose, where, where people can have a feeling for how these things connect? Well, clearly, I'm not an economist, so um, I can't uh, really say too much about that directly. But certainly, I think we would all recognise that we are constantly surprised by the way in which we set out with good intentions to achieve a certain effect. And we achieve sometimes not just not that effect, but the opposite. Um, and I think that's because we have broken the world down into simple static units, which we then reconstruct in a model, which is in no way like the business of life, which is seamless, constantly changing, interconnected, never offering precision and stasis. But precision and stasis are exactly what the models start from or imagine from, their, take their beginnings from. And a, a, a lot of the ways in which we understand systems are how they would be uh, when they were basically immobile and at equilibrium. And in the living world, systems are very far from equilibrium and they're very far from being static. Yes. And they're also ramified, things that we think of we can just deal with as a unit, and that must be right, um, is going to be massively interconnected with other things and have, as they say, unforeseen consequences, which if you had looked more carefully, you might have foreseen. I mean, another element to this is the extraordinary belief we have that certain things are good in themselves and that therefore their opposites are always bad. But almost everything that we, well, everything I think that we deal with in the real world has the potential to be good or bad, depending on partly how much of it there is. There is never something that is so good that just having more and more of it is better. You can often start going off down the steep part of the curve where things get worse. Like economic growth? or Economic growth would be one. Right. You can't right. just extrapolate yes. it forever. Yes. Um, and partly because, of course, we live in a finite world. So, so you, it's interesting you b began answering that question by saying I'm not an economist. And, and this is often the case with expertise in the public domain. People are wary of venturing into terrain that they're not familiar with. However, part, I think, of your analysis of, of the value of the second hemisphere is an insistence on context, wholeness, systemic understanding mm. of the kind that you can't really get from a single discipline, arguably. That Maybe you need not, a, a sort yes. of epistemic fluidity to yes. understand different worlds and, and what's of value there. Yes. With that in mind, uh, the next question is about um, how people should understand the, the, the nature of your argument. Because it sometimes sounds as though it's all in the brain, yeah. axiomatically, reductively, it happens yeah. in the brain and then it manifests in the world. Now, I know okay. you don't say that. No. However, it's also true that when people ask you for consequences of what follows, it's difficult for you to provide them without a great deal of tentativeness and, and context and nuance. So it reminds me of Yeats's yes, uh, yes. Uh, famous line that the, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Um, now, in that context, uh, I wonder if intellectually you're one of the best. You know, you've, people admire you hugely for the work you've done. But when people are really asking, what do we do? You know, what, what's the answer? How do we solve it? What do we, how do we fix it? You know. Your answer is, well, it depends, it's complex. Mm. 
you know, is that the right thing to do? Or do you have a responsibility to say, no, it is complex, and yet here's what I think you should do? I think I have a responsibility not to give a sort of solution, because that would give people the impression, first of all, that there is a single solution. And secondly, that as long as they do the following six bullet points, they can carry on living as they are. Um, so I can hint at things that we could do better, uh, and largely at things that we ought to stop doing um, the first thing, you know, I'm a psychiatrist uh, by, by profession and uh, when people come to me I very often know uh, in a way a list of things that they ought to start doing. It's hopeless telling them that because they're not ready yet to see why. So one of the things one does is identify things that they see that they're doing that are not helping. Yeah. So the first thing is to stop doing a lot of the things we're doing and I think give space for us to see, oh, well, we could do that and let's let, encourage that. What I believe very strongly is we don't, as it were, make things happen any more than a gardener makes a flower yeah, yeah. grow. The gardener can either smother it and deprive it of what it needs or give that plant the space and the nutrients and that then the plant grows. We don't grow it. And I know that's a small vignette. No, it's a but lovely it vignette. And it, the challenge here, and it's a challenge I often face as somebody in that interface between bodies of knowledge and, and questions of what to do, is that at an individual level, um, although it remains very complex, there's still some clarity of what might be done or not done or how advice might be rendered or yes. subtly suggested or whatever. Um, but at a societal level, with these sort of emergent properties of social systems and social structures, it's altogether harder to say anything of the form, mm. um, because of this you ought to do that. Mm. Mm. Which brings to the question of, let's imagine your work you know, is completely fulfilling and everything mm. works out for you, and your clarity on space and time and personhood and, and God and existence is, is pristine and distilled and beautiful and people understand exactly the right level of paradox and nuance and people speak that language of it's not quite like this, it's a bit more like that in that context. Mm. So if that were to happen, mm. would I be any clearer about how to live my life and would I be any clearer about how we might deal with climate change or, or I think problems so, of that nature? Because the clarity has got to come from within you, not put into you from without. Right. Indeed. All knowledge is of this kind, that it has to come from within. Yeah. And so it's a matter of if certain things happened in the world, then it would become possible for us all to see yes. the way forward. Um, not changing hearts and minds yeah. is a mistake in itself. We, we can only make progress if there is a change, a deep change, in the way we think about ourselves, the planet and our relationship to it.